All right, thanks for joining us today. My name is Jacqueline, I'm the Adult Services Librarian here at the Coronado Library, and we're thrilled to um, welcome Mr. Alexander Bevel today to speak to us about a forgotten chapter in North Island's history. Mr. Bevel, I'll turn it over to you. Yep. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Glad to show up. Now you're, I know we have a small, intimate crowd, but it's up to you to spread the word amongst your friends, because we're coming up on the 100th anniversary of this particular event. How's that? There we go. How's that? There we go. All right. How many of you have seen this? Have been up to Cuimaca Rancho? Okay. All right. How many of you know where Cuimaca Rancho State Park is? One, two, three. Can't miss it. Just head east on the eight, turn left at the scan. So go up Highway 79, you're in the middle of the park. So there'll, there'll be a map later to give you a general idea of where this thing is. Basically, it puts you in the mindset of those who are searching for it. I have no idea where it is. Now, let me give you a little back, back story that until 1944, the Spanish Bight, which now is between, well, no longer between North Island and Coronado, had separated the two into two separate islands. Well, Coronado became the city of Coronado in 1890. North Island has always kept its name as the North Island. And that's all for context, because I'll be referring to, to both Coronado and North Island. Now, we know that North Island is the birthplace of San Diego civilian and military aviation history between 1910-1913. It's where the Glen Curtis Flight School was established, United States Navy Aerial Training Center for about a year. The Army established its first permanent military flight school in 1912, and U.S. Army's first aero squadron was established at North Island in 1913. So basically, the Army was here before the Navy for a longer period. Rockwell Field was the major Army West Coast Flight and Combat Training Center, named after Lewis C. Rockwell. Unfortunately, you'll see that most of these bases are named after men who, who as they said in the, the right stuff, screwed the pooch. They, they didn't make it. Oh, before I go, any any former or current pilots in there? So I gotta, I gotta make sure I do that kind of stuff. <laughs> All right. Now, here's a shot of uh, North Island, which was uh, being used by both the Navy and the Army. The Navy moves in 1917, never left. And the Army was there up until 1938. That's an, that's an important date to remember. Rockwell Field was very busy. It was a major Army repair and assembly facility on the West Coast, both during and after World War I. It, I better remember, you know this guy, Hap Arnold? That name sounds familiar, doesn't it? He was the base commander, 1920, 1924. He was a pioneer pilot, earned his wings from none other than the Wright brothers. Let me back up, where he was, when he was training at College Park, Maryland, he actually saw Rockwell crash. So that's, that's in his, his memory. You wonder how many, how many, how many of these guys saw their buddies, their friends, just and, and yet they go back in the airplane and, and often fly again, learning from their mistakes. He was an award-winning record-breaking pilot. Importantly, in 1912, he won the McCain Trophy for successfully using aerial reconnaissance to locate a lost cavalry troop near Fort Myers, Virginia. The loss is very important. He'll, he'll use those skills he learned then later on. Arnold's duties were to assign pilots and aircraft from Rockwell Field to patrol, supply, and defend the international boundary line to the Arizona and New Mexico state lines. 
nearly nearly 2,000 miles of borderland from San Diego to Brownsville, Texas, had to be patrolled by the Army Air Force and, and cavalry and Army troops along the border. Rockwell Field was headquarters for the Western District. The majority of the aircraft were de Havilland's. These were made by the Aircraft Manufacturing Company Limited, known as the DH-4B, a workhorse of the post-war aircraft, American Army Air Service. Uh, top speed 140, cruising speed about 9,800, maximum range 478, this is important, it's only 22,000 feet, that's, 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 that's up there. There are over 1,500 in use after World War I. Go up to Army and the Navy. Now let's let's familiarize ourselves with the aircraft. The observer and the passenger's co-pilot. Excuse me. The observer passenger's cockpit is in front of the pilot's cockpit. It used to be the other way around in World War in World War One, where the pilot was was where the the rear machine gunner was. But they switched it around. They found out that's a lot better pilot to actually see the ground when he's landing. Now one problem, due to the placement of the fuel tank immediately behind the engine, after a crash, the aircraft turned into a flaming oh. coffin. That's what this, that was its nickname. Now, when, you, when you get aboard an aircraft that's known as the flaming coffin, my, hat, my hat's off to these pilots. Here's uh, the Haviland flying over Rockwell Field, North Island, on December 7th, 1922. By 9.15 a.m., it takes off. Its pilot is First Lieutenant Charles Leland Weber. He's a pioneer U.S. Army Air Service pilot, uh, 26 years old, he's all his accomplishments. The important thing, he was a pioneer pilot recognized for his recent contributions to the establishment of future transcontinental airways out of San Diego. <clears throat> he is very, very, very familiar with the route from San Diego over the mountains, over the desert, to points east. He had a very, very important passenger. Lieutenant Colonel Francis Cutler Marshall. He was then assistant to the Chief of U.S. Cavalry. He was 55 years old. Very courageous military leader. He fought, he led troops in the United States Sioux War, the China Relief Expedition, known as the Boxer Rebellion, and the Philippine Insurrection. He led a charge of the combined units of the 6th Cavalry and the British Bengal Lancers. To, uh, to, uh, to rescue civilians who were trapped by uh, Chinese uh, nationals. During World War I, he was a brevet, which means a, a temporary rank of a Brigadier General. He was awarded both the Silver, uh, Distinguished Service Cross and the French Croix de Guerre for his service leading troops during the uh, Meuse Argonne Offensive. After the war, the armistice, he served in the army occupation in Germany. To 1920, he turns to the United States, he's, he's downgraded to Lieutenant Colonel, uh, not a punitive reason, but because they didn't, they didn't need any more generals. The war's over. It's better than losing your job. He's appointed Assistant Chief, U.S. Cavalry, General Holbert. General Holbert directs Marshall to personally inspect the United States <coughs> Army cavalry camps and garrisons along the U.S. Mexico border between November and December 1922. Uh, recently, 1916, there was a little, uh, little trouble, a little more <coughs> trouble. Uh, General Francisco Pancho Villa sends his uh, troops across to raid. Columbus, New Mexico, April 1916, he basically destroys half the town. It's a wanted poster for his men. 
even though it's 1922, there's still a need for horse-mounted cavalry along the rugged international boundary line. And I would argue even today that there are some places where it's better to get to by horse mule than it is by, say, an ATV, a Jeep, or a Humvee. And this is particularly in conjunction with modern aircraft at the time. This cooperative use of U.S. mounted cavalry and aircraft and they patrol U.S. Mexican border. That's a that's a de Havilland for the flying over the over the troopers. December 6, 22, Marshall inspects the 11 Cavalry at Camp Lawrence J. Hearn near Oneonta. Uh, and then he I don't have the evidence, but I'm expecting he either got it in an airplane in fact to Rockwell Field, or he could have taken the train from South San Diego. But knowing him, I bet he flew. His next stop is Fort Huachuca, Arizona, 486 miles due east, about 20 miles north of the national boundary. Should get there between 1.15 and 1.30 p.m. San Diego time. He was to inspect the, the local RTC and the 10th Calvary camp at Sierra Vista. As you see from the newspaper insert, he would rather fly than sit his butt on a horse saddle to go the 486 miles. I mean, man, the man's a progressive. Except that route is known as the most treacherous to be found on the North American continent at that time. Major Arnold was concerned because there were reports of deteriorating weather over the eastern mountains. And although, as I mentioned, the, the Haviland had a 22,000 foot maximum ceiling, storm clouds could be even higher. Ice could form on the wings, the controls, the ailerons, elevators could ice up, the aircraft could stall, and could drop like a rock. Low ceiling and ground fog might uh, wreck, might conceal familiar landmarks, forcing him off course as well below the Kunimaka and mountain ranges, respective 59, 5,960 to 6,512 foot elevations. If forced to land, Weber and Marshall's chances for survival without food or water were slim to none. Now, Major Arnold and Lieutenant Weber had made no small effort to guarantee Lieutenant Colonel Marshall's safety. They made sure the aircraft was suitably serviced and equipped for the flight. The engine had been overhauled twice. Arnold, Major Arnold told Lieutenant Weber if he was unable to reach Tucson, whether weather conditions or anything was forcing him to deviate from his course and he had to land. There were emergency landing fields at El Centro, Mexico, Yuma, Tucson, <coughs> and Nogales. Oh, what a break. Major Arnold was so concerned that he even escorted Weber and Marshalls to have one over Choice Heights and his uh, SC-5 pursuit aircraft. He returned to North Island after watching Lieutenant Weber's aircraft disappear into a low cloud bank over El Cajon. El Cajon. Major Arnold instructed Weber to contact him by telephone or telegraph immediately upon landing. What's that telling you? There's no radio. There's no radio on board the aircraft. Phil's report back, December 7th, Sunday morning, December 8th, 1922. Arnold responds, he orders telegrams dispatched to various fields along the route to see if anyone had spotted the aircraft, immediately organized a search and rescue effort. This is where his previous experience looking for the lost cavalry crew in Virginia now comes into effect. It became the largest combined air and ground search in the United States military history during peacetime this time. 36 Army aircraft and four Naval Air Station North Island aircraft and two civilian aircraft were involved in the search. 
of those 36 Army aircraft, that is all flyable Army aircraft from San Francisco to Texas. So put that in context today, if all the Air Force aircraft were involved in a search for an individual. Arnold dispatched trucks carrying gas, oil, spare parts, motors, and other equipment from Rockville Field to an interim operating base at Camp Stephen Little near Nogales, Arizona. The famed Buffalo Soldiers joined the search. These were elements of what were then referred to as Colored 10th Cavalry and 25th Infantry Regiment based at Fort Huachuca, Douglas, Arizona, and Calexico, California. And they prepared to head west along the Arizona Sonora border or east from Mount Mexico. Local Indian runners were also involved in the ground search. The Arizona governor asked to send Indian runners out. We who knows the land better than them. It becomes a binational humanitarian search and rescue mission on December 12th. Mexican President <coughs> excuse me, Alvaro Obregón permits the United States military planes to fly 150 miles over Sonora and Baja California mountains and deserts. He orders the Morales, the federal uh, rural police force, to coordinate the ground search. Note, this was only five years after General John Blackjack Pershing's punitive expedition to Mexico in pursuit of General Pancho Villa. San Diego newspapers published day-to-day -day front page stories concerning the search. A lot of my information comes from the local newspapers looking to find ditch ties. He, uh, Arnold is constantly forced to follow false leads and rumors are coming. He has to follow these. Uh, a lot of them are just fabrications. People, yeah, I saw, yeah, I saw him. Well, I saw these two guys down by the, the, the ranch and he has, to, he has to send guys out there and he has to check it and, and they, they're all false leads. The news spreads nationally. See various from the Denver Post, New York Times, Sacramento Bee, and LA Times. They're all they're all sending out these these articles uh, coming in from from uh, on-site reporters. Some of it's a little bit. I don't know if they even left their their office to, to go check these out. Now, Major Theodore C. McCauley, who we'll learn about him later. He flew a search plane over Green Valley and the nearby Laguna Mountains in route to Calexico. No crash wreck sighting. Hope is now fading. The planes are ordered back. Calvert Troop will now start to, to engage in a land search throughout the San Diego backcountry mountains. Major Arnold orders the 11th Cavalry Camp Commander, Captain Gordon Heron, to lead a search party to the Cuyamacas. They head from uh, Camp Hearn, basically in Kura Beach. They're heading, they're heading uh, east along the border, and then they hit uh, Dulzura. They go to Hakumba, up to the Cuyamaca, up to Santa Isabel, and back down to Dulzura, and then back down to uh, Imperial Beach. No sight of any, any aircraft wreckage. So, Arnold believes that the aircraft had passed over the mountains before any accident could have happened. So the search is now shifting past the mountains into the desert areas between the Lagunas and um, uh, Arizona. But Lieutenant John Richter continues the daily air searches west of Nogales, Arizona. He's Lieutenant Weber's best friend. He's flying without orders. The War Department eventually gives him permission. He later joins an air search with two naval station North Island, the Havilands, to follow the Colorado River to the Gulf of Mexico. Major McCauley leads an automobile search with three officers along possible flight path from January 15 to 23rd. He, they interviewed 29 eyewitnesses. Each one positive they had seen the Weber Marshall aircraft fly overhead on a 7 7. 29. The Army officially drops both Marshall and Weber from their commission officers register. Basically, that means they're 
MIA, possibly dead. The War Department dispatch says that despite the most vigorous prosecuted and extensive search of its kind yet attempted by United States forces, the disappearance of Colonel Marshall and Lieutenant Weber will remain one of the most unsolved mysteries of aviation history. Mystery solved, perhaps. At 7 a.m., 7 and 8 a.m., while conducting a cattle survey along Apache Ridge, Rancher George McKean stumbles upon a grizzly site. Let's, let's give you some point of reference here. Here is the Scanso, the town of the Scanso. Here is Green Valley, where now the Highway 79 is to Quigamaca. And then you can take the road, once they put it in, up to Julian. It's at this time, the road to Julian runs this way. He stumbles across charred bodies shrouded in snow, believed to be current marginal and whatever. Right about this point here. He sees it's a wreckage that has the star and the red circle and the blue circle, Rondell. That indicates it's a U.S. Army aircraft. As it was in use from 1921, 1941, so within that, that time period. They discovered human remains, two scarred, charred skeletons. They're both lying behind the ruptured fuel tank, steering assembly, and dashboard. Remember I pointed out the position between where the pilot and the passenger was. And then there's the fuel tank, and then there's the engine. There's the tree. <clears throat> McCain arrives north to Lake Koyamaka carrying a burned piece of canvas, bearing undecipherable letters and figures. He notifies the Lake Dam custodian, John Peterson. Peterson based telephones his boss at Fletcher, who's in the California National Guard. He telephones Major Arnold. Arnold requisitions a base truck to transport him and four officers and six men overnight to Green Valley. Men hike up the Habacha Creek drainage to the crash site. Major Arnold and others arrive at the crash site. McCain and the San Diego Union newspaper reporters and photographers are already at the site. And they may have disturbed the site. I ask myself, who are these two Army officers? I believe one is Major McCauley, the other is Hap Arnold. If so, we have two historic individuals pioneer army pilots associated directly with that site. That's good, I'll tell you why later. Pat Arnold became commander of the United States Army Air Force in 1940 45. He's known as the architect of a modern American Air Force. He's a five star general, one of the few in both the Army and the Air Force. So we have, we have. The, the site associated with an individual's early career and development as a major player in the United States military history. Macaulay, you see all his all his credits, he's very familiar with North Island, he learned how to fly there, became chief instructor. <coughs> I think, I think, I joke myself, okay, he got he gets his wings in 1912. Well, he hadn't crashed. Want be instructor? I, I mean, that's that's a pretty short turnover. He's stationed at uh, Fort Worth, Texas. He's in records. More importantly, he assisted with the planning and mapping of potential air routes in the Southwest region. Like Weber, he pioneered and mapped air route from Fort Worth to San Diego, December 1919. So he's fairly familiar with that route. After World War II, when he was a colonel in the United States Army Air Corps Air Transport Command, he became a member of the National City and Shula Vista Chamber of Congress. He also became a leader in the Coronado Civic Club 
and manager of the National Trust and Savings Bank of Coronado. So we've got a Coronado connection here. Major Arnold held an informal quarter of inquiry on site. They identify items belonging to Lieutenant Weber, his cap, his name tag, watch, pistol, bolo knife. Items belonging to Colonel Marshall, his West Point rank, class of 1890, his glasses, and his cavalry sword. Now let's talk about what happened. After they investigated the site, they went look at their notes on who they interviewed previously, went back and talked to people, and this is the basic scenario of what happened. By 945, an aircraft was spotted flying over the Alpine Federal Forest Ranger Station. You guys know what Alpine is? Okay, so that's a good idea where we're at. But the supervising ranger who had used to work at March Field in Riverside, which is an Army Air Base, IDs the aircraft as A to Haviland DH-4B. Uh, 1955, aircraft reported flying over the Scansa Federal Forest Ranger Station. About 10 a.m., the aircraft is heard flying over to Scanso Valley in a low cloud cover. About 10 5 a.m., the ground witnesses reported observing the military aircraft flying out of the low cloud cover over the Scanso. The local rancher exiting the Scanso store reportedly seeing the aircraft circle, then veer northwest to avoid hitting the 48, 72 foot high Watai Peak. Due to worsening weather conditions, Lieutenant Weber proceeded north following the Scanso Creek in Green Valley. Remember, Major Arnold told him, if it looked like you're not going to be able to go over the mountains, because of deteriorating weather conditions, come back come back to Rockwell Field. So that's what he's doing. He's, he's basically making a sweeping curve. He knows that there's a valley there somewhere. He also knows that there are between 4,000 to 6,000 foot mountain peaks between the valley. He tries, he tries to stay in that valley following the old state route 79. He planned on circling above the lake to gain enough altitude to get his bearings. Height's a good thing. He was then to head northwest between north and middle peaks above Boulder Creek before flying on a southwest bearing back to Rockwell Field. That's the plan. Problem was, Weber and Marshall were flying through a low cloud cover above heavy ground fog. He has no idea. He has absolutely no idea. The problem is, yes, he has a compass. The compasses are subject to magnetic errors. As an altimeter, which only measures current altitude above sea level, what, what's, what's he missing? My, my pilot friend, what is he missing? But what's, what's he missing? What, what, what instrument is he missing? He has no idea where the ground is. Yeah. Yeah, the altimeter. Well, he's got the altimeter. He knows he knows his height, but it's a height at sea level. He may be at four thousand feet. The ground may be at thirty-five hundred feet, and above, and right in front of them might be something that is at forty-five hundred feet. He has he has no idea of, of the ground contours under him. So no artificial horizon. Like I said, he has no idea where he is in relationship to the mountains around him. Estimated speed about 9,800 miles per hour. Probably three minutes to head towards the 4,593 foot Apache Ridge, southeast of uh, the 6,492 foot Cuyamaca Peak. He's too low. Ceiling, ground fog may have obscured trees along Apache Ridgeline. He pulls back hard on a rudder to lift aircraft over the ridge 
you can now you can now see the treetops and see the ridge. It's that that I'm being recorded, so I can't say it. It's that oh poop mo moon moment. Pulls back, doesn't panic, pulls back, too late. During this time frame, the aircraft careens through the treetops, evidence of tall pine trees with their tops sheared off. The aircraft's rear rudder and one elevator snags the treetops, rip completely off. Then both left upper and lower wingtips torn off. Leaving behind scattered trail of splinter pieces of wings, fuselage, struts, and other fuselage parts for 30 yards on the hillside. Aircraft careening along ground before smashing into a large tree. Maybe it's that one. I'll use it for a guesstimate. The impact forces the radiator back into the front of the engine. The fuel tank driv is driven forward into the rear of the engine. It ruptures. About 97 gallons of gasoline vaporize and ignite on hot exhaust manifold pipes. Turning the wreckage into a flaming coffin. Uh, it was estimated that, hopefully, from the condition of the bones, that the skulls being being fractured, the arms and the legs are being are being fractured and, and, and basically disarticulated. That the impact hitting the tree, hopefully mercifully either knocked them out or killed them outright so they didn't experience the horror of being, being burnt to death. Now, this radiator used to be in the Dyer House, which was the, the headquarters of the Cuyamaca Rancho State Park. Uh, I took a picture of it and I looked at it and I go, oh, I know I know aircraft crash specialist, but I know a bad thing when I see it. Because it looks like this, you can see where the engine, that's a that's a V12 livery engine that's on display at the uh, air station museum. You can see where the top of the, the engine smashed into the radiator, curving it. And you can see where the engine propeller shaft housing smash through the bottom of the radiator so you can you can imagine the the impact of that of that like i said the crushed skulls and broken leg bones indicate that hopefully they were dead before they hit the ground animals had scattered smaller bones the wet rain soaked ground kept the fire from spreading beyond the radius Subsequent snowfall, ground fog, dense tree canopy, and remoteness obscured wreck from aerial and ground observation. That's why. Well, how come they? That's why. It's May 14, 1923, Major Arnold, four fellow officers and privates from Marco Field, they bring the airman's remains down. Uh, they bring some of the aircraft parts down to with them to a truck in <coughs> Green Valley. They head back to Marco Field. McCain had supplied the pap mules. That, yes. Now, uh, Lieutenant Richter, Weber's buddy, accompanied his remains on a train to the Weber family home in Denver, Colorado, buried in a nearby cemetery. The burial was officiated by Lieutenant Weber's father, who was a reverend at the time. Two Army Air Service to Haviland and four bees dropped flowers at the grave site. Lieutenant Richter delivers a eulogy at the funeral service, stating, the service knows and will remember. Unfortunately, the service forgot. And doesn't care. Colonel Marshall's remains were sent by rail to Arlington National Cemetery. War hero, all that. But ultimately interred at West Point Military Academy Cemetery for his widow's request. What's wrong with the inscription on the tombstone? Anybody? Orange. Hmm. So what? They weren't found until May. No. It's spelled. That's a that's a girl's name. That's a girl's name. It should be an I. Yes. It should be an I. I know. How do you miss that? I mean, how they, how they miss that? 
Yeah. <laughs> I know. Miss that game school. Now here's the first the first memorial. These guys from about 70 airmen, soldiers, and civilian employees from Rockville Field climbed to the crash site. They carried tools and, and schlepped bags of concrete up the hill. Uh, I've, I've made that hike not direct like they've done. It's about a, about a mile. I've done it several times when my arthritis, my knees gave out. Uh, it, it, every time I did it, it nearly killed me. It's, it's, it's a rough, rugged, narrow, rocky, bumpy trail. There are several ways up there, and I'll show you them later. They hand mixed the concrete on site and poured into a wooden form. It's, it's Hapacha Creek, and spring is right there, so they had to supply water. They, they, they pressed into the wet concrete parts of the, uh, of the engine and airframe wreckage. You can see they built a wooden form around it. Prentice Vernon Reel, civilian supervisor, Rockwell Field Aerial Repair Shop. His picture shows him holding a cast bronze memorial plaque he made before the installation of the memorial. They have a short memorial service on site. A few days later, Major Arnold Reel and four fellow officers return to the site and install a time capsule. It's about a heavy three foot long brass metal tube. They put it under the cement slab. Seal the top with wax. Has a list of the officers and enlisted men from Rockville Field who were actively involved in the search and recovery mission. Contain copies of the San Diego Union articles covering the crash and its victims. And has a 1923 City of Coronado Masonic Lodge calendar, which tells me that these men were more than casually associated with the City of Coronado. Now, their, their social life is probably centered around it. that's where the girls are in Coronado. Uh, in a letter to uh, Weber's father, Arnold said, me and my men have done everything possible to improve your son's memory to the present and coming generations. The owners of the ranch, um, Mr. and Mrs. Ralph Dyer, uh, this is the building which became the park headquarters, uh, they had put a protective easement around the crash site so that it may forever stand as a monument to two great men who gave their lives in the service of their country. Arnold realized that because of its relative isolation and lack of adequate trails, the airplane crash memorial would be seldom visited by the public. The Army had flyovers during the anniversary of the crash up until 1938. It discontinued after that because the Army Air Service was no longer based in San Diego. The crash site memorial would only be visited twice in 1923 and 1933. Now, uh, February 16, 1933, California State Parks required the former Dyer Ranch and it wasn't mentioned that I am a former historian of California State Parks. That's where my interest in this originated. It'll become California State Park, to become Cremaca Rancho State Park in March 33. The historian of the directs the National Park Service to cooperate with the California State Parks to improve and new park. Hires a civil engineer, Charles Carter, to survey the park's new boundaries. Work was conducted by members of the Civilian Conservation Corps, where most of the CCC leaders were active for reserve army personnel. They would have had prior knowledge of the 13-year-old crash site significance. However, they had no idea where it was located. They had spent several Saturday afternoons searching fruitlessly. Boom, yes. It's called voodoo history. Uh, civil engineer Carter basically trips over the memorial while he's doing his survey. And when he went back to report it, they sent him and the crew went back, he couldn't find it. And they basically found it accidentally again. Now notice, this is a, a picture taken around 1934. You can see the engine mount, part of the engine mount, the bronze memorial plaque, maybe an oil tank, 
and over the 10 years or so, there's, there's water erosion on the base of the, the concrete block, which is for, forcing the exposure of the aircraft engine, which they had buried under the, the, the concrete slab. Triple C crews improved public access to aircraft crash memorial. And that's, that's an important factor when I write my national registration nomination, that the federal and state governments recognize the historical importance of that crash site. They improved the crash site memorial trail to connect park visitors to what they regard as a mountain sanctuary. And if you do, you make it up there and you look out towards the, towards the east, it, it's, it's a magnificent, absolutely magnificent view. 1960, the United States Department of the Interior ID'd Monument Trail and Airplane Ridge. Why they didn't call it Airplane Crash Ridge? I don't know, that probably wouldn't, wouldn't entice, entice people to go to visit it. But there's, there's the, where the crash site is. And there's a direct trail known as the Monument Trail leading from the uh, Green Valley Camp Picnic Area. It's also it's called the Arroyo Seco Picnic Area. You can, you can head on up that. And it's yes, it's a direct route, but it's like the trail would be here if you're walking up it. That's that's how, how steep it is. And because it's the lowest thing, when it rains and the water flows, where's the water going to flow? Right along the middle of the trail, exposing all that ice, that ice rough rock. In 1968, the California State Parks, they zoomed the aircraft engine. Why? I'm not sure. I could not find any evidence as to why they did it, but they did it. They placed it on a new stone concrete masonry pedestal. They replaced the bronze memorial placard onto the new stone concrete rubble masonry pedestal base. They installed new stone concrete masonry retaining walls, bench, and approach steps coming from the upper elevation and away from. They found the time capsule. Because basically they, they tore the whole thing up out of the ground. Inside were newspaper articles talking about the crash. And what's funny is reading, reading the newspaper articles about this, the park rangers had no idea what this thing was. I mean, it's like today talk to them out there and I don't know what it is I know, to read my article. So there's also the copy of the uh, Masonic Lodge calendar, Coronado. And the list of signatures of the search team. There's Arnold, there's Randolph, there's Hein, Richter, and Smith, and Seifert. And Seifert of all these all these men was the only one who was still alive and they, they were able to contact. And, and he helped identify the men and what happened. Now, Seifert is also an important individual because he is a member of the flight team that took the first air overfueling in history. There's Seifert and there's a pilot, Roberto Line. Remember I told you that the positions of the aircraft were switched. So Pine is the pilot, Seifert is sitting in the observation seat. It happened over Rockwell Field on June 27, 1923. Look who else is involved. Smith and Richter. They all received distinguished flying crosses. October 26, 29, a devastating wildfire, basically nuked Cuyamaca Rancho State Park. The firehouse that contained the relics, the 
the radiator and stuff associated with the aircraft is in the basement. The roof is now in the basement. So, and when they cleared out all the debris, there was nowhere to be found. So December 7th, the fire was what? October, anniversaries. Anniversaries coming up. So I go out there, 2003, in my capacity as a California State Parks historian, I, I schmooze the park superintendent and I say, I'm, I'm concerned as to whether or not the monument is still there. It's, it's cast iron, cast iron may, may survive, but it's also cast aluminum. What happens to cast aluminum if it gets really, really, really hot? You've got a, you've got a, a flare, it'll, it'll ignite probably melt the cast iron. So I'm heading up there. The superintendent gives me a uh, gives me a walkie talking and he tells me now stay on the trail. Whatever you do, don't deviate off the trail because there are several root clusters that are covered with ash, but they're still burning. Okay. And that trail was about Three to six inches deep in ash. It looked that remember that rough rocky trail I was telling you about? Look how, look how nice and smooth it is. All that's ash. It reminded me of the aftermath of the napalm drop at the end of the movie platoon. That's complete, utter, utter devastation. So I'm heading up there. I'm heading down the trail. I don't know what to expect. I'm getting closer and closer and closer. I see the engine. And, and my, my heart is becoming uplifted because the closer I get, I go, oh, that damn thing survived. And you can see, you can see the utter destruction around it. Some of those shrubs actually survived too. The Manzanita. But a lot of the chaparral is all burnt. And the flag that my wife and I put up there Still, still survive. And someone was nice enough. Uh, uh, yeah, and the plastic flowers we put up there are just a, yeah, just a little bit, just a little bit, a little bit melted. <laughs> someone just put a middle, a lucky middle horseshoe. And look, there's the original bronze plaque. There's, you can see there's the wreckage along the wall there. That wall. Uh, was built in 68 because none of the stonework shows up in that 1934 photograph. And you can see my, my, my wife and, and, and my own prints in the, uh, in the ash. All well, that's ash. And a little bit later, you can see the engine, you can see the uh, bench, you can sit up there, you can watch the bees going in and out of the. Uh, the what is that called? Oh, that's there. It's it's a it's a plug when they when they pour in the metal. Um, it'll, it'll pop in my head. Anyway, there's a beehive in there. So I I, I say, oh, it's a it's an adaptive reuse of a historic structure. They don't bother you. They don't bother them. Freeze plug. Freeze plug. Thank you. I'll take stay catapults for two hundred. Uh, you can you can see you can see the, the engine is an artifact in itself. It also shows the the severity of the uh, the crash. Now we're closing up here. There is no interpretive information other than an almost hundred year old bronze plaque to mark the site of the crash. The search of which was associated with the largest combined trans border air and ground search in the United States military history at that time. December 8th, 1922 to May 5th, 1923. That's that's all. If you're hiking up there and you haven't come to my lecture and you see this, and what does that mean? They fell at this spot. Who fell at this spot? Weber and Marshall? Did they trip? Mm. I mean, how, many, how, many, how many people are going to realize that that's an aircraft engine? Yeah, it's an engine. It's got 12 cylinders. Maybe it was a boat engine. 
why is a boat engine up here in the middle of the, the forest up in the, in the mountains? Nothing. You can go down to the interpretive center. There's no information about the crash or the memorial. And I'm trying to fix that. It's also associated with the early careers of several pioneer aviators who will go down and play major roles in American military aircraft history. Neither monumental nor imposing. It's a simple expression of three generations honor and respect. First in 1923, then again 1934, 1968. Representatives of federal and state governments built and approved the memorial, including access so that Present and coming generations would honor the memory of the two pioneer military aviators who died on this spot serving their country while flying outdated machines through treacherous skies over forbidden terrain. That was said by Major Henry Hap Arnold. He knew they were flying outdated machines, and yet, off you go. If you want more information about the history of the crash site, I wrote an article way back in August 2005. It's online. Uh, the website of the San Diego History Center's to the Journal of San Diego History. Just type in my last name, Bevel, E V I L, and Airplane Crash Memorial. It'll pop up. There's also a copy online. Uh, I wrote the Quinnock Rancho State Park historic background study and historic inventory. I included a, a section in there about the history of the, uh, the memorial, the monument, why it's significant. And uh, whenever I talk, they must, have a, they must have a high turnover at the park. But whenever I mention it, they go, oh, is that what that is? Yeah, it's really frustrating. Uh, I had I had to salvage the uh, flag because uh, the time I went up there, I go, well, where's the flag? S someone had taken it and thrown it down uh, on the on the trail below. I'm going, no, nah, I don't think so. That's that's coming to me. That really, that really cheesed me. So oh, it's 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 a place of honor next to Ralph. A landscape, uh, and that's that's during during COVID. He's wearing a mask. Uh, I am going to now that now that it's probably like my next to last presentation. Uh, hopefully, we'll we'll give one uh, through Zoom to the Coronado, excuse me, uh, Colorado Desert Volunteer Group, explaining to them. Why it's significant. I'm not going to really say this is the history of this. This is why this is significant, so that they can tell folks why it's significant. That should be coming up hopefully in December around the time of the 100th anniversary of the crash. And I will be sending out letters of support to every organization I give my talk to hopefully that they will copy the letter sign it saying yes we support the designation to the National Register of Historic Places just just because now if you want to get up there there's one two three four five six ways to get up there each one is a challenge in itself. The, uh, I don't know. I always think that, I always think that, oh, I'll try a different route. It's gotta be easier. And it's like, okay, this is still steep and it seems longer. It's a lot easier going back, but, but now with my knees, it's, it's more painful going down than it is going up. So um, I asked the current archaeologist, district archaeologist, if she would be nice enough to send a crew up there to update the recordation 
of the monument, the trail, the walls, and everything, so that I can incorporate that into my National Register nomination. She said, yes, I really have to thank her for that. So, let's go back. But anyway, so there, there, there she is. She's still there, I hope. <laughs> you know, barring any other uh, disaster. Um, thank you.